Um, but I just want to uh, welcome everyone. Um, I want to say maybe you might be expecting Kat Ramirez up here. Um, unfortunately, Kat, uh, the director of the CLRC and one of the PIs uh, uh, for our program on non-citizenship, unfortunately had a family emergency. So she's not able to, to join us. Um, but she sends her regrets and uh, her greetings. Um, and anyway, we'll give you an update if there's anything um, further. Um, so again, just want to thank everyone uh, for coming. Today is sort of a culmination of, a, of actually a couple years of work um, on um, thinking about migration kind of broadly um, and um, a, a project that started a, about a year and a half ago when we applied or thought about applying and thinking about across the um, disciplines and uh, different divisions of how do we think about sort of issues around migration and belonging. Um, and so, uh, uh, quite a, I guess a little over a year ago, we came together and there was a, the potential to apply for the Andrew Mellon Foundation's John E. Sawyer Seminar on Comparative Study of Culture. And um, Kat really pushed us and the IHR uh, to apply for this grant um, to really get a chance to bring some leading lights um, to the university to be thinking about this. And I got to admit, when we started this process, I thought there was no way we were going to get this grant. <laughs> Um, but we started thinking about it and it started gelling around the idea of non-citizenship and belonging. And we felt that this was in particular brought together, wove together a lot of really interesting work being done on migration and belonging across the disciplines. And so we started seeing it as a really interesting and productive unifying theme. Um, and so we, uh, we ended up applying for it and you know, lo and behold we got it and had a fantastic year in collectively thinking about these issues. Um, and today we get to celebrate some of um, sort of the, the product of, of, of everyone's collective labor and some of the great minds that we were able to bring here or bring together. Um, and so today um, we want to celebrate our uh, postdoctoral fellow and two dissertation fellows who have been writing uh, about really at the cutting edge of thinking about belonging and non-citizenship. Um, so, but before we get to, to hearing each of their uh, a, a bit about their research, I want to first thank uh, Jackie and some of the staff at the CLRC for this entire uh, project has really been to be able to bring us all together. And I was gonna. <laughs> I was I was gonna pause so we have a little applause first. For that. And the IHR that has also been a very a great sort of um, companion through all of this and been fantastic in bridging again the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences. So give it up for the IHR as well. Okay. Um, we do want to say today it is being filmed so that we have a record of what's uh, happening. So the, uh, we'll be having um, the video of what's going on. But we also have uh, Juan Davia is also doing um, another video. So we're, that's why we're getting two. Uh, and they're doing a promotional uh, video for the CLRC. So um, that's, that's why we're having so much media here. It's, uh, <laughs> you won't be on the local news, I don't think. But uh, uh, OK. Um, and so. Um, Again, uh, so today, again, we're celebrating this, um, the, the culmination of what we're doing. So we have the three wonderful sort of uh, fellows that have been part of this. And so I'll introduce them. I'll give you the names now, but then uh, in more detail just before they come up to speak. So um, uh, Dr. Emily, uh, Emily Mitchell Eaton is the CLRC um, Andrew W. Mellon uh, Foundation postdoctoral scholar this year. So we want to say thank you. Um, and, um, and then our two, um, our, our two dissertation fellows, Claudia Lopez, doctoral candidate in sociology, but will be finishing very soon. <laughs> um, and Sering Wang Mo, um, also a dissertation uh, fellow um, here in literature at UCSC. Um, so we're going to hear first from, uh, from our postdoc fellow, uh, Dr. Emily Mitchell Eaton, who will come up. Uh, and as she does, um, just to give you some background, she got her PhD uh, in geography from Syracuse um, University last year in New York. Um, her fields of interest include migration and diasporas, US empire, critical ethnic studies and racial formations, citizenship, uh, critical legal studies, militarism, um, in the U.S. Pacific Islands and feminist and queer theories. Um, and she brings this all together in her research on the Marshallese migration to Northwest Arkansas and what she calls the new destinations of empire. She also looks at U.S. immigration policy, labor, and race. 
She holds a master's in public administration from Syracuse and a bachelor's in Latin American studies and Portuguese and Brazilian studies from Smith College. And um, over the upcoming, the next year, she'll be the Patricia C. and Charles H. McGill III, 1963, visiting assistant professor of international studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. So please. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so I just want to start out by expressing my profound gratitude to Kat and the CLRC, um, the co-PIs, to Jackie Powell and Alina Fernandez at the CLRC, um, and also the IHR, um, and also to my co-fellows, um, Claudia and Sering. It's been such an incredible honor and opportunity to work with you both this year and um, to be part of the Sawyer Seminar uh, and kind of um, develop our own work in, the, in that context. Sorry, this is part of pregnancy. Yeah. You get out of breath a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how my own research and how that fits into the context of the Sawyer Seminar themes on non-citizenship, mobility, uh, labor, and precarity, and belonging. So citizenship and legal status have played crucial roles in the management of imperial populations since the creation of the modern nation state. Um, for immigrants from non-sovereign sites in an empire, their efforts to migrate to the metropole often reproduce them as second-class subjects with limited economic, political, and mobility-based rights. Many scholars have looked at these phenomena in the context of other empires, British, French, and Dutch empires, um, but there's been less work done in the context of the U.S., so that's um, what my research aims to do. So. Um, to situate us sort of in the context of U.S. empire, I'll take you to the Pacific. Um, and I, my work really looks at the period of uh, the mid-1940s, post-World War II to the mid-1980s, um, during which time the U.S. Uh, functioned as a sort of colonial administrator over much of the Pacific Islands. And here you have sort of a map um, up here for reference, uh, an inlay map of where the continental U.S. is. Um, so this whole area was referred to as the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. So as these territories were transitioning into different statuses in the 1980s, um, commonwealth status or gaining formal sovereignty from the US, they entered into negotiations with the United States federal government over what kind of immigration and, and citizenship status their residents would have. Um, so each, each territory undertook this process separately. Um, so my research is going to look at one particular example, which is the Compact of Free Association a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and the Marshall Islands in 1986. So with the passage of the compact, the U.S. government created a new category of legal status for residents of the territories, the compact migrant, or COFA migrant. And um, comparable agreements were also negotiated with Micronesia and Palau. You can see here in oh, the red outline, which should be shifted up a little bit, uh, is, is what's currently the Marshall Islands. Um, and here you see depicted in cartoon form a sort of diagrammatic representation of what that would look like for residents of the Marshalls and Micronesia traveling off um, to various sites with their new legal status. So the compact, uh, the migration provision that was elaborated in the compact granted the option to live, work, and attend school in the U.S. without a visa indefinitely to hundreds of thousands of people. However, the compact does not constitute any direct pathway to U.S. permanent residency or citizenship. And this contingency solidifies COFA migrant status as provisional, liminal, and categorically unresolvable in a way that I argue is characteristic of what I'm calling imperial citizenship. So let me just explain what I mean by imperial citizenship. Okay. So imperial citizens are those citizens included partially, contingently, and often temporarily in the nation. Such inclusion can occur through piecemeal construction of imperial legal statuses, for example, through treaties, bilateral agreements, special provisions, and other exceptions to standard citizenship, and also through immigration laws and policies. This exceptional inclusion may look like preferential treatment when compared to other immigrant groups. Right? These are benefits that not all immigrant groups in the US have. Um, most notably, perhaps, imperial citizens sometimes benefit from a heightened mobility as long as they're moving and migrating within the empire in question. However, 
Um, we can also think about how that mobility is often necessitated by the workings of empire. So in the example of the Marshall Islands, the US conducted nu nuclear testing in the islands in the 40s and 50s, which then necessitated the exile um, of, of hundreds of thousands of people from their own atolls and to, and to the mainland US. So in that sense, um, despite the rights and benefits that may accompany imperial citizenship, its partial, contingent, and revocable nature constitutes a kind of rightlessness that produces precarity for those who hold it. Now the forms that imperial citizenship take vary across sites. So this means it may look different, for example, in Guam than it looks in Puerto Rico, American Samoa, or the Marshall Islands. What these variations of imperial citizenship share are their limitations. They're legally provisional, in other words, revocable through amendment or legislation, and they tend to impose restrictions on their holders. For example, restrictions on the right to vote, travel freely across US borders, or pursue education or employment in other sites of US empire. Residents of non-sovereign US territories thus do not enjoy the full range of legal benefits associated with formal US citizenship. In developing the concept of imperial citizenship, I look to existing theories of partial or restricted citizenship. Um, and these include such concepts that you might be familiar with, such as second class citizenship, cultural citizenship, and transnational citizenship. While each of these concepts contributes something important to an understanding of imperial citizenship, each one falls short in capturing the particular dimensions of imperial citizenship as it's experienced by colonial subjects. So for example, transnational citizenship theorizes migration between nations, but not within empires. In the case of Marshall, I Marshall Islander migrants, their movements are both transnational, so occurring between the Republic of Marshall Islands and the US, and intra-imperial, moving within the geographic entity of empire. Examining forms of imperial citizenship, such as COVA status, can tell us much about the productions of US citizenship at the margins of empire, and how those margins between metropole and colony, foreigner and citizen, become both clarified and blurred when put into practice. So now I'm gonna take you on a leap to Northwest Arkansas um, in order to talk about how imperial, imperial citizenship materializes on the ground. Um, and Northwest Arkansas here is Springdale is the largest site in the Marshallese diaspora, um, surpassing even, even Hawaii. So here I'm going to be looking at encounters between Marshall Islanders and three different groups of public actors. The first, law enforcement or legal actors, um, second, social service providers, and third, immigrant rights advocates and activists. Um, so each of these contexts offers a different vantage point on how COVA status is interpreted on the ground. Yet each one also prevents actors from seeing certain dimensions of that status. So here we can think of the allegory of the blind man and the elephant, right? So each one is touching a different part of the elephant, the tusk, the ear, the side, um, and is describing it differently, but each one is unable to kind of conceptualize the elephant as a whole. So most significantly, due to the lack of an awareness of the US's global role as an empire, public actors in Arkansas were unable to see how the precarity and rightlessness of Marshall Islanders' legal status was produced by US imperial control over the Pacific Islands. So in other words, they were unable to see this or understand it as a kind of imperial citizenship. Okay, so first I wanna discuss some of the interviews with law enforcement actors. In these interviews, many struggle to articulate where exactly COFA status fit on a spectrum of illegal to legal. As one city attorney put it, uh, describing Marshall Island, Islander immigrants, I've just been told they're legal. I think the Marshallese court interpreter told me that they're technically here legally, whatever that means. So in the, explaining the concept of legal, you would think a city attorney might have some grasp of that, right? <laughs> so he, he, he discussed this concept of legality um, in doing so reproducing a legal, illegal binary um, wherein immigrants either fell into one category or the other. He indicated that he wasn't exactly sure what legal meant in practice, but determined that Marshallese immigrants were in fact legal. Um, this, came, this theme came up frequently in interviews with these types of actors. So here's another example um, from an interview that I conducted with two senior police officials. And she said, well, Marshallese immigrants don't have to have a visa to come in, or they don't have to have a passport. Which is it? Their pathway to citizenship is, what's a good word, complicated. So again, this officer conveyed a perception that COFA status is not quite a free pass to live in the US without conditions. 
As she attempted to explain, Marshall Islanders' path to citizenship is complicated because the Marshall Islands was a U.S. protectorate, not a foreign country. So this statement is not fully accurate, but it does convey her perception of the Marshall Islands' semi-colonial status in relation to the U.S. Um, the second group of people that I interviewed were um, public actors were social service providers. So whereas the legal actors I interviewed focused really heavily on this definition of immigrant legality versus illegality, social service advocates tended to understand COFA status in terms of eligibility for benefits and services. So this is more in line with what we think of as social citizenship. So here I'm going to focus on my interviews with healthcare workers for whom a central concern was COFA migrants' ineligibility for Medicaid. Uh, and this was a restriction put in place by the Clinton administration, the presidential administration. Excuse me. The implementation of the Affordable Care Act added another layer of complexity to the Medicaid ineligibility issue. In Arkansas, even experts in health services were often unfamiliar with COFA status, which made it difficult for COFA migrants to receive services. Although, as one advocate pointed out, Marshall Islanders' misclassification as refugees could also grant them access to benefits for which they normally wouldn't qualify. So, for example, if an administrator made a mistake and categorized them as a refugee, then they might uh, actually end up getting a benefit that they weren't legally entitled to. Thus, while COFA status did not always block migrants' access to certain benefits, it often had the effect of complicating that access. Two interviewees expressed frustration that Marshallese youth with COFA status were not covered under our kids, which was the state um, CHIP program, or Child's Health and Children's Health Insurance Program. Another advocate mentioned that the ACA did allow COFA migrants access to certain kinds of health coverage. Uh, however, due to the vague wording of coverage rejection letters that Marshall Islanders had been receiving, she worried that many of them might assume that they weren't eligible for any health care coverage at all, which was not, in fact, the case. So, in short, because of the ambiguity and the uniqueness of COFA status, Marshall Islanders often did not receive health benefits to which they were entitled. Um, and I saw the same effect playing out in other areas as well, including housing and higher education. In short, social service providers' engagement with citizenship through a framework of benefits and access enabled them to observe the partial rightlessness produced by COFA status. This framework did not, however, account or make room for an analysis of the historical imperial power relations that produced such rightlessness in the first place. Okay. And finally, I'm going to turn to a third group, um, immigrant rights activists. So these activists that I interviewed understood legal status through a framework of rights and justice, which enabled them to see certain dimensions of COFA status, particularly its rights-based limitations and its larger political significance. However, like the other two groups, immigrant rights organizers in Arkansas generally missed the imperial dimensions of COFA status. Excuse me. Questions of immigration status weave their way through the work of these activists. Their organization's focus on legal status emerged as a response to the precarity and vulnerability produced by undocumented status, a precarity that had been amplified by an increase in, a recent increase in immigration raids. Furthermore, Many community activists were undocumented themselves or had family members who were. So their work was thus shaped directly by their personal experiences of living without papers. Um, as such, many expressed a nuanced understanding of legal status as more complex than a legal-illegal binary. Uh, and thus, they are more likely to understand COFA status as something beyond or between legal and illegal. As many interviewees expressed, legal status had become a focal point around which immigrants with very different statuses could organize and resist rightlessness, bringing together, for example, COFA migrants with DACA recipients or DREAMers. Many activists felt that it was crucial for Latinos and Marshall Islanders to work together on these issues, and some organizations had begun to form Latino Marshallese coalitions. Despite some misperceptions and tensions between these groups, many activists felt that the possibilities for creating solidarity between Latinos and Marshall Islanders were potent, if not yet actualized. So here I'll draw on a quote um, with the Latino community organizer I interviewed. And she said, excuse me, I think that the concept of immigration is very present for both the Latino and the Marshallese communities. Even within the Latino community, you see that rivalry as well, documented versus undocumented. Both communities are fearful of having the little things that they have made here be stripped away. 
So in summary, the activists I interviewed pursued a range of strategies and tactics to advance immigrant rights, many of which focus explicitly on questions of legal status. Most non-Marshallese activists, however, lacked a clear understanding of COFA status. This in some ways limited the coalitional strategies that different immigrant groups were able to use. Furthermore, because non-Marshallese immigrant rights activists were often unfamiliar with the history of US occupation of the islands, they were generally unable to see COFA status as imperial citizenship. As such, they missed an opportunity to conceptualize status-based rightlessness as part of a US imperial strategy that had been implemented beyond the US mainland. So just to summarize, while each of these group, each group of public actors was able to capture parts of the nature of COFA status, its precarity, its legal in-betweenness, and the rights and benefits that it either bestowed or restricted, they missed the imperial dimensions of that status and the imperial histories that gave rise to it. Okay, so now I'm just gonna jump over um, to talk a little bit about um, what the Sawyer Seminar has enabled me and enabled us collectively to do um, this year. And I have to say it's really, it's really made our work, kind of moved our work forward in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, so the first thing that I want to highlight, I'm not going to go through each of these, but um, is the research cluster that the three of us fellows um, pulled together on the topic of non-citizenship, a spectrum of belonging. Um, and this research uh, cluster had seven participants, several of them are here today, I think. Um, and we met over the course of two quarters to share work, um, workshop ideas, and uh, the culminating event was a day-long paper workshop in which we each read each other's papers, provided written feedback. Um, and I was, must say this was really immensely um, fruitful for all of us as we were able to workshop papers that we might submit for publication, um, present at conferences, and the like. Um, the, the support from the Sawyer Seminar also allowed me to return to Northwest Arkansas, um, my, the site of my previous fieldwork, in November to give a research talk to the community, um, conduct a radio interview at the local NPR affiliate, um, and to reconnect with organizations that I had worked with in 2014. I was also able to submit two uh, articles for publication and to draft a, um, a completed draft of my book proposal, which I'll plan to submit to publishers in the coming year. Um, another thing that the Sawyer Seminar really enabled us to do was to kind of um, have new venues for presenting and workshopping our own research, um, which was an inordinately helpful. Um, these included not just conferences, but also um, radio shows, some of which were hosted by um, our own Silvana Falcon, one of the grant PIs, um, as well as Center for Cultural Studies and a number of other venues on and off campus. So that was a really rich opportunity for us as well. And then finally to close, I'll just talk very briefly about, excuse me, um, some of the future directions that I see my work going. Um, the two main projects that I hope to be pursuing um, are on post-colonial migration policies and immigrant-led social movements in the US. So the first project examines the history of immigration and citizenship agreements negotiated by the US federal governments and the territories. So whereas my dissertation was looking at um, the policy between the Marshall Islands and the US, I'm now hoping to conduct a more comparative analysis, um, historical analysis of similar policies with places like American Samoa and the US Virgin Islands. The second project, um, one that I'm really excited about, is uh, will similarly be a sort of comparative approach between immigrant and social justice movements in a number of different sites. So in Arkansas, I was able to look at how Marshall Islanders and mainly Latinos organized together um, in the context of labor rights and immigrant justice. Um, I hope to expand this to additional sites in places like Hawaii um, where to look at how those intersections are playing out um, either in similar ways or in different ways. Um, in Hawaii, for example, um, these communities tend to be organizing additionally around issues of environmental justice and demilitarization. Um, and I'm, as Steve mentioned, I'm excited to share that I'll be pursuing this work next year at Trinity College in Connecticut. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Emily. So uh, what we're going to do is um, hold, we're going to have a question and answer period, but we're going to have all the fellows speak first, and then we're going to um, have a collective question and answers uh, after that. So you, if you hold your burning questions, we'll get a chance to do that. <laughs> um, okay. So um, 
Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Claudia Lopez, again, a doctoral candidate in sociology with a, a designated emphasis in feminist studies and Latin American and Latino studies uh, here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, she's uh, been one of the two uh, uh, dissertation fellows um, and participated in, in, the, in the research cluster as well as all the different events that we had um, interacting with. Again, it was so productive to have so many conversations with different visiting researchers. Um, and Claudia very much participated in, 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 and contributed to those discussions. Her dissertation, um, entitled The Life Cycle of Forced Migration, examines the urban resettlement, integration, and partial citizenship of rurally, inter uh, rurally internal displaced persons in Medellin, Colombia. Um, and uh, pending the signature of her dissertation advisor, <laughs> uh, she will begin uh, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Cal State University Long Beach in the fall. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone. Um, I'm really excited to share uh, my research on internal and forced migration in Colombia. I specifically examine the forced migrations of peasants from the countryside uh, due to conflict, analyzing their urban resettlement and integration in the city of Medellin. And so really this workshop has helped me highlight the influence of displacement, and into, uh, displacement on integration and citizenship. So while uh, they do not cross international borders and retain their national citizenship, I found that internally displaced peasants in Colombia experience forms of non-belonging that negatively affect their sense and practice of citizenship. And so these Sawyer seminars on non-citizenship have really challenged me to ask, what are the forms of non-belonging that test the limits of citizenship? So as we begin, really, when we think about Colombia, oftentimes we think about coca production, trafficking, the show Narcos, right? <laughs> but what is less talked about is the over 7 million people who have been internally displaced in Colombia, making Colombia the country with the second largest population of internally displaced people in the world. And so this has happened over a 50-year civil war between left-wing guerrillas, right-wing paramilitary, and the Colombian military themselves. And so we have the massive displacement of peasant farmers stuck in the middle of this, which has uh, resulted with 90% of them resettle in the urban centers of the country. And so here we have a map of Colombia. Um, the dots right here represent uh, the different armed actors, guerrillas, paramilitaries, and so we can sit, really see where the war is centered. I specifically work right here in this, it's called a department, Antioquia, and right here is where Medellin is located. So you can really see that these, uh, the dark brown area, that this region suffers one of the highest rates of forced migration, but it is also one of the main receptors of displaced persons. And so here we look at the city of Medellin that is really important to know its history to understand how it receives these incoming peasants. So if we look at the 80s, Medellin was the homicide capital of the world. We had Pablo Escobar, this was his hometown, he was the head of the Medellin drug cartel. And really interestingly, this used to be a very conservative, uh, sleepy textile town. But as political scientist Mary Roldan tells us, it was the cocaine economy that modernized this city. And so, but it's really interesting because in the last seven years, it's made this shift from homicide capital to this new urban miracle. They have this aggressive rebranding through greening projects, through this innovation. It has now made, this is not the capital, but some people feel it should be the capital of Colombia, but it's this innovative giant. Like someone said, we are trying to be the next uh, Silicon Valley of Latin America, <laughs> which is very interesting. But what's really uh, problematic is the more than 300,000 displaced persons that have resettled in the peri-urban areas in, uh, that line the city. And so really here I look at their segregation in these informal settlements and their inability to participate in the formal urban market. Really people do not want to hire them. And why? Because they see them as represent representations of the conflict entering the city. And so now we see these people who are now segregated, not only uh, spatially, but now even social economically. And of course, this affects their upward mobility. 
And so while many people looking at Colombia and looking at displacement have focused on the displacement event or the immediate resettlement, I really wanted to say, well, what's the afterlife? Right. And so the people I work with are on the peripheral areas and they have been living there. My uh, sample of 81 interview displaced interviewees had been in the city between eight and 22 years. So you would think that they've already after two decades right, have been integrated, but I found that many of them continue to live in protracted states of displacement, which means uh, displacement for five or more years, lacking durable solutions, and unable to fully enjoy their rights. And so in order to understand what does this look like, how does protracted displacement continue, I really wanted to understand how does displacement influence integration and citizenship? So in a nutshell, well, in a flash, this is my dissertation. Each of my chapters focuses on one of the phases of what I call the life cycle of forced migration. And so using the life cycle of forced migration as an analytical approach allows me to examine processes related to displacement over time and also pushing us beyond just looking at displacement and resettlement to looking at it as a lifelong process, right? Um, that links these four phases, providing a multi-staged understanding of the processes of citizenship and belonging from the perspective of the state and the displaced. So I did interviews also with uh, administrators, either from humanitarian and social work programs, and also urban planners. And so here, going quickly through the phases, during this phase of uh, displacement, I really wanted, I asked the displaced, well, tell me about your memories of displacement and life before you were displaced. And so interviewees talked about the lack of protection in the rural areas that led to their displacement, and even discussed the violences caused by the military themselves that also led to expulsion. So now we have to understand why so much displacement. And really here in this chapter, I talk about the, uh, we need to understand land. In Colombia, land is power. So these campesinos, these displaced peasants, really represent a barrier to gaining that power. And they are disposable, right? And so really understanding from their perspective what it means to be displaced from the territory is not just a displacement from place, but also a displacement from livelihood, economy, community, and their own identity and self. So in this way, we have to understand their identity of campesino is a place-based one. And so when I would ask them about the past, right, we're thinking about this in terms of the, the creation of a new awareness, what I call a displaced consciousness, um, which results from trauma and loss. And really this is, um, I would ask them, so tell me about life as it was. Oh, I had it all. And even they could have been poor, but it really they equated with, I could grow my own food. But then when I would ask, do you want to return? And most said no. And they said, I saw too many things. And so in this way, understanding that what they hold with them subjectively is understanding the past, the countryside, both as utopic and haunted. So within this next phase of resettlement, I found and I focused on my interviews with uh, the city administrators, there's problematic program structures. You get emergency aid for three months. And in three months, you should be integrated, right? Well, that's not always the case. <laughs> and also, I found that these social workers really blame them. A lot of times they said, well, you've been here a year. Or they would say, it's their culture. And that especially what happened with Afro-Colombian or indigenous groups. They said it's just that their culture, they don't know how to be citizens of Medellin. So in this way, understanding that the displaced now lack these durable solutions and this identity shift, right? Now from peasant to urban displaced creates this situation where it's very difficult to integrate. So here, like Natalia said, she was frustrated that the government would no longer help her. And she said, they said it's that you've already been here a long time. You should already be established. And she says, how are we ever going to be established if we left our farms, our houses, our livestock with nothing, nothing, because they gave us three hours to leave with nothing. 
So here in the third phase of integration, I really found that these durable, uh, these situations where the resettlement programs maybe gave you $300 for the year, yet didn't give things like training to be able to insert yourself into the formal urban labor market, and also they were segregated in those peripheral areas that I was telling you about. And so there was, taking from Espiritu, there is this differential inclusion going on. They're included, they always retain their citizenship, right? They're included as victims, but they're excluded also as victims. So in this way, understanding also the spatiality of it, right? So here, as I said, I focused on the peripheral areas, and this is a picture I took looking down at the city center. And so it's really important to know that of the 735,000 homes in Medellin, one in three are in informal settlements. What happens, the people get together, they say, let's go up to this mountain range, we'll cut down trees and we'll squat and create our own community. And so really here we understand that now they are, the way that the city views them or the society views them, a lot of times I would tell like my neighbors, oh, I work up there, they go, oh, in a barrio? They were really kind of shocked that I would dare enter into there. And so really seeing that, that these are the expelled. And so there I argue the importance here of understanding place, landscape, and affect. I argue that these areas of the peripheries are a borderlands both geopolitical and psychological, as Anzaldúa describes, a place where the prohibited and the exiled inhabit. However, here in the borderlands, as I'll show in the next phase, the displaced consciousness that ex experiences waiting, loss, and nostalgia now develops as a form of possibility. So here in this last phase, this really came from, as I began to see from my sample, there was a distinct group of people who were displaced leaders. They were community leaders that had started those informal settlements. And through that process of building their neighborhood, they had built leadership skills, they got knowledge on how to navigate the system. And from there, naturally, 20 years later, now they were these prominent leaders in the city. And like I was dis explaining before, in the last seven years, Medellin has done this ur uh, aggressive urban rebranding to, build, uh, to develop these uh, projects, like an extension of a metro cable and a pedestrian walkway. And all that was targeting the settlements in the peripheries. And so they really began to stand up in these moments and say, no, we will not face another double displacement. And in this way, I'm thinking about it, first displacement from the countryside, and now, after having, as they say, rebuilt the territory in the urban, experiencing another displacement again. And so in this way, they have now used the displaced consciousness, this way, understanding we are displaced, we are peasants, but we are also Colombians, as one woman said, and therefore we need to ask for our rights as a group. So now they're using the displaced consciousness as a tool for contesting further expulsion from the nation. This is a form of also creating a community in exile, uh, kind of how Serene will be talking about as well. And so really here, Monica says, the, says, we defend the territory because we feel it like it is a part of us. We feel that this territory opened its doors to us when the city closed them to us. The community grabs the displaced and says, you count and embrace them as part of us, the countryside, the land, the pure air. Unfortunately, the, land is in, the air isn't 100% pure, but we find space to breathe. That has been something very beautiful because when you look up at the peripheries, you know that the residents are victims. And who do you see? Trees, mountains, and who is up there? Us. So in this way, I began to think through displacement influences integration and citizenship, even of national citizens, by making them into partial citizens, right? Which I define as a new social status that is both inclusionary and exclusionary, where one has rights, uh, ha claims to formal rights, yet is limited from practicing these rights fully. And so for me, being able to develop this was being able to speak with Bridget Anderson, who came as part of our series, and actually picking her up from the Dream Inn and bringing it over here. 
<laughs> was how I developed this. So, <laughs> And so talking about Anderson, Anderson argues that modern states are held together by a community value rather than a random collection of imagined members. Sering will talk in her presentation about the community of value. And so Anderson moves us beyond this formal uh, binary of citizen, non-citizen, creating a more nu nuanced typology of citizen, where she says, well, there's the good citizen, the failed citizen, the tolerated, and the non-citizen, which is the immigrant. And here she says that the good citizen populates the community of value, and these individuals are, quote, law-abiding and hardworking members of stable and respectable families. The good citizen is the liberal sovereign self, rational, self-owning, and independent with a moral compass that enables him to consider the interest of others, end quote. On the other hand, the failed citizen is the individual or group who have failed to live up to the ideals of the community of value. As Anderson argues, like the criminal or the welfare cheat, the failed citizen, quote, may be formal citizens, but they, have strong, they are strongly imagined as an internal other who have proved themselves unworthy of membership in the community of values, end quote. In this sense, the failed citizen lacks rights because they do not have the correct values that are valued by the community, which are interlinked to economic worth, independence, self-sufficiency, and hard work. Anderson also introduces us to tolerated citizen, which is like the refugee or the forced migrant who is temporarily accepted into the community value based on their subordinated status. And this is supposed to be temporary. So applying this to the case of internal displacement in Colombia, I really thinking about the way forced migration turns peasants from the good campesino to the tolerated displaced and later to the failed urban citizen. The majority of campesinos interviewed worked in informal markets in the countryside, but they were self-sufficient. They could grow their own food. However, being uprooted from the rural and the inability to contribute to the urban community due to stigma, lack of formal education, and urban job skills makes it difficult, if not impossible, for the displaced to experience upward mobility. So applying Anderson's typology, the displaced are no longer the good campesino citizens, self-sufficient and productive. Rather, they have now become, over many years, the failed urban citizen. So during the first stages of resettlement, the state treats the displaced as a tolerated citizen. And the process of reception via resettlement po policies is the national project. And why? Because the resettlement of millions is needed to, and it is integral to the security of the nation state since waves of poor, jobless, and traumatized citizens creates instability in the receiving community. However, after years of not participating in the valued labor, segregation in informal sectors, and dependence on the government, the displaced shift from tolerated citizens to failed citizens due to their inability to contribute to the Medellin community of value. While the displaced are not fully excluded that from the labor market, their position as informal workers and displaced citizens is partial. So then ultimately, this research project uh, demonstrates the limits of integration and national citizenship, offering a more nuanced lens for examining citizenship as a spectrum pushing us to examine belonging beyond a binary of citizen, non-citizen, included, excluded. And so now I'm going to be shifting from talking about my uh, research to really being so grateful <laughs> to the Mellon for the time and the financial support to do many different projects, everything from research clusters um, to being able to submit uh, two single authored articles and a co-authored piece, and also my first uh, my first presentation at a geographer's conference, I may go over to the dark side of Emily. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but these were all through my conversations in the seminars, we are always deeply rooted in this. Uh, I was able to do talks and some invited uh, lectures and also radio shows. Never had done that before. Uh, one in Medellin and two here with Silvana Falcon. And um, service, what I'm particularly, uh, my, a project near and dear to me, uh, worked with Sahar and Alina, is co editing the Women of Color journal that will be forthcoming in fall 2017. 
And uh, I really want to appreciate, uh, unfortunately, Kat, but also Jackie. I have an ongoing photo exhibit called Expulsion, um, where I work with photographers and community organizers from India and the US. And I've used this creative project as a way to apply the concept of the life cycle of forced migration in different contexts as a method of visually mapping the outcomes of and resistance to global expulsions. And so this creative project has helped me think of ways that I can animate research for public engagement and so this was from uh, and I was able to bring in one of my students Alma Villa um, and we presented this when Bridget Anderson uh, talked at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History and then most importantly I was able to finish my dissertation and be on the job market <laughs> and I got a job so that's great <laughs> Um, and then um, last but not least, kind of thinking about where do we go from here. And for me, this project really, I want to continue in Colombia thinking about the longitudinal effects of displacement on the children of the displaced. Interesting, I would, uh, I would interview these people who said, yeah, I'm displaced. But then they were children. They don't remember being displaced or resettlement, but they still strongly identified as displaced. And so for me, really understanding how feelings and experiences of intergenerational non-citizenship or how displacement is handed down um, really uh, is interesting to me in terms of shaping feelings of national belonging that might motivate community or political engagement or lack thereof. In addition, as I'm heading down to Long Beach, I would love to kind of apply this concept of partial citizenship to other forms of displacement and specifically looking at gentrification in urban areas like Long Beach. And uh, Steve McKay's um, No Place Like Home project uh, offers a really great model model for beginning to think about that. And so here I'm ending. I want to give a big thank you, of course, to the Mellon Foundation, to the Sawyer Seminar Committee, to the IHR, to Kat and Jackie, who've been amazing, to my fellow colleagues who I've worked with. It's been amazing working with you both, both academically and personally. Um, I also want to thank my committee, Jonathan Fox, Miriam Greenberg, and my advisor, Steve. Thanks. <laughs> and I want to thank you all because really this is my last presentation as a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz and really it's kind of for me an honor to be able to present this day in a really beautiful end to one of the best yet most stressful years of my graduate school life. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That was, that was great. Okay, and so... Um, uh, our, our final speaker and fellow, uh, Sering Wagmo, um, will be talking about her research. Uh, Sering uh, grew up in Tibetan communities in, in Dharamsala, uh, Dharamsala, India, and Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, before enrolling in the doctoral program here in literature, um, she earned a BA and MA from uh, Lady Sri Ram College in, in New Delhi, and an MA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, she. Uh, uh, also received an MFA in creative writing from San Francisco State University. Uh, in addition to being a very accomplished poet, she's a scholar of Tibetan nationalism, diaspora, and non-citizenship. Her dissertation, From the Margins of Exile, Democracy and Dissent Within the Tibetan Diaspora, juxtaposes the external struggle for international recognition of the Tibetan government in exile with the internal struggle to command Tibetan unity since the Chinese occupation of Tibet in 1950. So um, please welcome Sunny. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here to celebrate the end of a wonderful year. Um, and thank you, Emily, for helping me with um, the slides. <laughs> we discovered, yes, I was not supposed to say that, but I'll, I'll say that. We discovered yesterday that I can't multitask. <laughs> like, I cannot click and speak at the same time. I was just getting so confused, you know. So, so Emily's helping me. Um, so Emily and Claudia have, uh, you know, spoken so powerfully about um, citizenship and how it's not a guarantee to full membership uh, in polit polities that uh, exist. And I'm going to sort of make a slight shift to speak um, about belonging within a polity that does not exist legally. So I'm going to focus on um, Tibetans who have uh, the status of uh, refugees in uh, India and Nepal, and for whom citizenship is an idea and an ideal 
that's rehearsed within a government in exile. So the Tibetans, um, Tibetan refugees in India come from the three uh, provinces of Tibet. Um, Tibet is colonized, so there is, you know, the numbers are always a little hard to figure out. So six million in total, and um, I think about 150,000 in exile, and, and about 80 or 90,000 um, are in India. So the Central Tibetan Administration, formerly known as the Tibetan Government in Exile, under the Dalai Lama, was established in 1960 to rehabilitate about 100,000 Tibetans uh, who had fled from Tibet in 1959. Um, they are among the oldest refugee groups, but you don't often hear about them. So the exiled government is uh, a political anomaly. It's a territorial-less entity that functions like a state and consists of an executive, a legislative, a judiciary um, branches, as well as a constitution um, and seven governmental uh, departments. So it provides a range of paradiplomatic uh, programs that include a kind of a citizenship to Tibetans um, it used to be called the Freedom Card. It's now called the Green Book. Um, it provides health care, education. Um, Tibetans can vote for the government in exile um, employees. And um, it even has embassy-like representatives in uh, 11 countries. It doesn't, however, enjoy formal recognition by any for foreign, um, I mean, sovereign state, um, but provides a sense of belonging um, to uh, Tibetans who live within the territory of other nation states. So, I, so I'm, I'm applying the term refugee citizen here just to highlight you know, the ways that um, the exiled government plays the state game in that um, Tibetans are provided um, a citizenship card um, which qualifies them for the programs. Um, that, it, uh, that, that, that it provides, and also um, it provides sort of a hope of a membership into um, a future Tibet that is to come. As you can see, there, the uh, exile government has a website, and um, Nancy Pelosi was there last week, um, or this week, I guess. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm calling... Um, I'm not going to refer to it as a Central Tibetan Administration, which is sort of the, um, the title that it holds now. I'll just refer to it as an exile government um, for the stock. So the idea of Tibetan citizenship, which includes uh, a history of ideas and arguments about what it means to be a Tibetan and how the legality of status and rights are to be understood and contested, came with the loss of homeland, and they're articulated under the conditions of displacement. And from the very beginning, the political movement led by the exiled government was defined as a two-fold political struggle. One, to achieve full democratization of the government in exile, and second, the liberation of Tibet from Chinese control. So in order to achieve these goals, the exiled government took two approaches. One, to seek recognition from the international community and the other to undertake direct negotiations with the Chinese um, authorities. My dissertation contends that the Tibetan project of nation building under exilic conditions must be seen as a constant negotiation between a politics of deference and unity on one hand and a politics of dissent and difference on the other hand. And I'll explain a little bit later what I mean by deference. So I examined pamphlets, memoirs, and official uh, memorandums that were distributed in the 1960s in exile that deployed the concept of unity and democracy as crucial uh, to the national project of independence. And I argue first that unity was an exclusionary um, discourse to normalize one identity at the expense of others. Um, unity became a dominant framework for thinking about the boundaries of belonging, political obligation, and the loyalty of the Tibetan people. It was imposed as a guarantor of freedom, and it functioned, I think, by disciplining personal freedoms. For example, um, disobedience uh, to the exile um, polity and the Dalai Lama 
um, and his visions, right, were viewed as acts of national disloyalty. So the very logic of uh, exclusion um, or the formation of the disloyal, um, I think, mobilized contesting desires for inclusion and also provoked categories of minorities that um, had not existed prior to the Chinese invasion. And here, I, um, my project sort of calls much needed critical attention to the Tibetan Welfare Association. That was the name that um, a group of 13 uh, leaders um, adopted. So these were 13 lamas and chieftains um, of nomadic tribes in eastern Tibet, um, whose nascent expressions of democratic dissent revealed the fissures between dominant narratives, um, national narratives, and latent communal desires. So these individuals, they viewed unity as an invitation to belong, um, but not as they were. So they asked the questions, um, what am I asked to give up? And what am I asked to become? Okay. So I'll return back to them again. Um, and second, what I do in my dissertation is I analyze Tibetan democracy's ambivalence that I, I think arises from what I call the sacralization or the Buddhization of um, democracy. And this is in large part because Tibetans accept or believe uh, democracy to be a gift bestowed um, by the Dalai Lama. And I'm, I'm going to get there to democracy, but I want to sort of um, detour by talking about how this year's um, fellowship on non-citizenship really helped me to think through some of the ideas. So first, when I read a transcript of um, a meeting in 1978 that took place between uh, the leaders of um, the Welfare Association uh, and um, representatives of the government, I was very disappointed because I thought that the um, transcriptions were sort of boring and they were very vague and circular. Um, there were two things that stood out. Um, one, and both actually were questions raised by some of the younger members of uh, this group. And the questions were, uh, quote unquote, are we needed or are we to be abandoned? Thus far, do you think we have anything useful for Tibet's freedom? So they were asking uh, government uh, officials this, these questions. And I wasn't, I wasn't able to find sort of the right um, approach, I think, to these questions at that point. Um, Bridget Anderson, you know, when she um, discussed how the modern nation is not an arbitrary collection of people, but tied by a common legal status, but a community of value, you know, it really sort of made me think about the question of need as being um, also a question of value and recognition. So the community of value, and Claudia has already spoken so beautifully on that, um, the question of value is really one of the ways that the state claims legitimacy and also you know, overlaps with ideas of the nation. Right? So um, Claudia discussed how those who are seen to break with the values um, or who are seen to fall short right, or fail to hold the values are excluded in a variety of ways. For example, um, the tolerated or the failed citizen. Right? And they have to um, endlessly prove themselves as having the values or um, having to be valued. Right? So the group of 13, um, the Tibetan uh, Welfare Association, they were not willing to be tolerated. And they came together out of a combination of solidarity, but also political strategy. And they constituted themselves um, as Tibetans in a way that challenged the dominant narrative. They built their own settlements, and they also refused to get the Green Book. So um, the Green Book was not distributed in the 1960s when they formed. Um, but when, you know, in the 70s, that was when the Green Book uh, people adopted it, but they refused it even at that point, right? So this is one of the settlements in northern India that um, one of the uh, 13 groups um, settled. And in, I think it was settled in 1965. It was very difficult to get there. It still is very difficult to get there. Um, so as a result, you know, they were labeled as being anti-government and traitors. 
so my intention here is not you know, to downplay the um, achievements of the exile government under the Dalai Lama. Um, what I'm attempting to do in my dissertation is the following, to study how peripheral groups uh, use the new concepts of democracy to alter the ways of being political. And thus I'm interested in looking at relations between governments and um, oppositions in general, um, as well as to illuminate questions of loyalty and legitimacy. I'm asking what internal oppression might look like. And I'm thinking about different modes of depicting the past, which is to ask for a kind of history that includes the contributions um, made by people right, in developing Tibetan nationalism. So thanks to um, this fellowship, you know, I have been able to really immerse myself in um, my research and write um, four of the six chapters drafts of my um, dissertation, and I'm halfway through um, uh, a fifth chapter. I hope to finish it by July. Um, and this fifth chapter is really outlining some of the ideologies that provide the relationship between nationalist thought and the policies um, adopted by the exile government. Um, I discuss how democracy and unity are linked in that Tibetans in the 1960s you know, were asked to pledge um, to, um, um, what is the word, um, to follow, right, the democratic policies of um, the Dalai Lama and the exile system. So I'm, I'm suggesting that the most crucial value to membership in exile is deference to um, the polity authored by the Dalai Lama. And this part, is very raw. I'm still working through it, um, and other than my uh, other than discussions with my um, uh, with uh, Chris Connery and Christine Hong, I haven't really um, you know thought it out too much. So Tibetans often refer to democracy as a gift, as I've said earlier, and scholars working on um, democracy point out that it's a gift that is largely unopened, and in fact, you know, the more Tibetans accept the gift the more they seek the Dalai Lama as sort of the ultimate authority. And I think this intensifies the relationship Tibetans already have as being indebted. In 1963, the Dalai Lama explained that the future constitution of Tibet, which was being drafted at that time, was consistent with the teachings of Lord Buddha and with the heritage and the history um, of, of, of Tibet, right? So, the atavistic formulation of uh, Tibetan democracy suggests democracy is not a movement from tradition to modernity, um, but that um, democracy is an ancient Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So however, you know, monastic institutions developed over time in, in, uh, in Tibet are found on deeply hierarchical systems that maintain economic and social inequality. So aspects of uh, nationalist thought um, are better understood in the speeches and writings of Samdung Rinpoche. Um, he's a scholar, a religious leader, and a political leader. And these were speeches made between 1997 and 1999. Um, now he proposes that the uniqueness of uh, Tibetan democracy is that its most ardent advocate is the leader of the state and that it's modeled on the equality of all beings. And equality in this uh, model of democracy is accomplished through what he says, the everyday practice of cooperation. It emphasizes duty and sacrifice over rights. So according to him, Tibetan democracy is an attempt to follow the radical democracy of a Buddhist tradition, one in which quote unquote, everyone lives for the other. So the defining feature here is its goal of love and compassion. And something Rinpoche suggests that genuine um, Tibetan democracy is yet to be achieved in exile because it lacks one of the three requirements of a perfect democracy, which he says an enlightened citizenry um, who can recognize the right vision of the Dalai Lama as the leader and the right vision of the ideology of democracy um, as laid out by the Buddha. So this ideal of a self-regulating community under a ruler who expresses the will of the people 
does not really think within the framework of nationalism. And part of what I'm trying to establish is the difficulty of practicing dissent in a society where Tibetans are seen to be always already linked to the Dalai Lama under the laws of Samaya or religious bond. So the solemnizing of um, personal religious devotion into political responsibility means that religious duty will always supersede a political desire. So the current attributes given to Tibetan democracy, I think, make it much closer to a spiritual practice. So ultimately, um, Samdong Rinpoche's critique of modern democratic societies and Tibet and Tibetans um, are about people and not institutions of power. The Tibetan people are led to the movement and there is little sense that he places value on the principle of all people having a political voice on inclusion and participation because the focus on moral purity delinks subjects from organized political power and I think even from history. So democracy is not so much about the present moment or even maybe about the political struggle, um, but it is a solution that is meant to be universal. And the dominant political ideas are ultimately closer to a moral framework within which Tibetan exceptionalism is understood as a, a universal responsibility. So Samdung Rinpoche perceives the struggle for a future Tibet not for the nation um, as an end in itself, um, but that of a nation, quote unquote, as a means to accomplish a more lofty function beyond the promotion of its own egotistic interests. And what it advances, I think, is a, is a sacrifice and renunciation of a political nation for a moral benefit of preserving um, Buddhist inner sciences that can lead not just Tibet, um, but the entire world out of um, its present crisis. So I'm interested in the contradictions in the Tibetan struggle. It is a nationalism that is simultaneously fighting for national independence and a struggle, um, a surrender to the truth of a higher freedom. It's a nationalism that's based on a critique of the self-centeredness of the nation state while um, behaving like a state. And it's a democratic movement that has at its core the principle of renunciation and um, duty to Buddhist truths. So the form formulation of um, Tibetan democracy as exists presently, I think, enhances you know, Buddhist um, universal utopias and the, the sort of idyllic stereotypes of Tibetans as like peace-loving and uh, predisposed to harmony. <laughs> um, so I'd like to conclude by, you know, thanking um, Kat Ramirez, Jackie Powell, um, and Alina Fernandez, and all of the co-PIs, um, as well as IHR, for making this the most creative and the happiest of my six years in um, at UCSC. Um, you know, I think being recognized as a Mellon Fellow has given me confidence that this work matters. You know, it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's very elusive otherwise, um, as many of you might, um, you know, understand. <laughs> um, on our first meeting, you know, when um, um, Claudia and Emily and um, I met with uh, Kat, she said, what can I do for you? And she asked this at every meeting. Um, and, you know, I think that gives you an idea of the kind of support that we've received this year. Um, in addition to the fellowship um, and the time and the support that I've received, I was also given a grant to um, conduct, um, to translate a lot of the texts that I had, which I couldn't read because they were in a cursive writing. Um, so I was able to get about, um, about probably 300 pages um, translated, and I read a lot of uh, additional pages with uh, a scholar. I, and that would have taken me a whole year, um, you know, without um, the support. I'm also writing a long poem around nation, and just last week a few of those poems were um, selected uh, to be in an anthology of Asian American 
poetry from the Poetry Foundation. So this is number three or four. <laughs> um, so, you know, the experience of being part of discussions with scholars across the disciplines this year has really helped me think more about the role of refugees and undocumented in imagining alternate forms of uh, social and political life that you know, extend beyond the nation state boundaries. And it's made me consider, for example, the ways in which the Tibetan um, exile government does help to raise questions regarding views of legitimacy and the relations between sovereignty um, and territory. So, you know, one, one of the questions that I've been thinking about lately is, what does it mean when a state in rehearsal asks its people to give up the goal of independence for a different kind of freedom and sovereignty, right? a freedom that's free from capital and from competition? I mean, it can be a pretty radical idea. Right? Um, and last October, we discussed the irony um, you know, with Bridget Anderson of that in spite of all the rights in international law, there is no right to be granted asylum. Right? And um, Bridget posed the question, should we be creating different kinds of citizenship and what might that look like? And individuals without citizenship, those with partial citizenship, imperial citizenship, um, you know, we've just heard from Claudia and uh, Emily, um, you know, they have been asking that question for a long time and they've also been acting on those questions for a long time. So I um, just want to say that I feel really fortunate to have had the opportunity to spend this year with um, such brilliant and kind uh, scholars and even better that um, I can call some of them friends. So I hope that we can continue to build on these conversations. And thank you all again. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Sering. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you for the beautiful part.